Okay, look, I don't think I intended for this episode to be until much later in this series. If you're new to this series, it's called The Voodoo Child Chronicles, and it's following me trying to get as close to the tone on Jimi Hendrix's Voodoo Child, track number four of Electric Ladyland, the slow blues voodoo child. Now, I can't really hold this video back because as you'll see in a moment, there's a rather large elephant in the room that I wouldn't be able to keep hidden very easily whilst making other videos. So I think we've just got to go for it. Uh, this video probably jumps us forward quite a bit, but there's still a lot to talk about after this. But this video is gonna be a fun one, I think. Right, let's jump straight in. This is the amp that I think Jimmy was really using to record Voodoo Child. That might be a bit controversial given that most people on the internet think it's a basement, which we've already covered earlier in the series, but we will obviously compare to this one. But yeah, you gotta hear this and see what I'm talking about. So I think that's it, the Dual Showman by Fender. This is the huge 85 watt beast of an amp that Jimmy played for quite a while during 1968, the same year that Electric Ladyland was recorded. Now I think even more key is the cabinet that's with this amp. This is a closed back two by 15. I cannot tell you how big this thing is. It's gonna be great fun finding a place for it in this room, but I think it's just, quite amazing. It's uh, magnificent actually. The guy I bought it from, Jim at Sweet Amps over in East London, he came and dropped it over for me the other night. He seemed quite sad to see it go. It's been in his shop for a long time. He said most people have been too scared to turn this amp on and try it. The funny thing is, it's really not the, uh, the beast that I thought it would be in many ways. I'll explain more about that in a minute when we go through some of it. It's quite a unique sort of amp this. 85 watts of clean Fender headroom through two by 15s is amazing. So there's a bit of a story, I guess, as to why Jimmy's not famous for using the Dual Shaman. But basically he was using them for several months and then one night at a gig uh, after the first few tracks, they broke down. The amp he was using just sort of conked out. Um, and he ended up using a Marshall for the rest of that night. What happened then was uh, another amp company rep, Sun Amps, was in the audience that night and he thought it was a good opportunity for him to sell Sun Amps to Jimmy. So he said to Jimmy, look, if I give you an artist deal, if I give you some amps, 
will you play our amps? And Jimmy said, look, bring them to a gig I've got in a week, have them set up for me, I'll try it out. So he tried it out, he thought it was all right. It was like a 100 watt amp, I think. And so he signed up with, with Sun and that lasted the grand total of a, a week when he then publicly said, I think that was a mistake going that way. And he went back to Marshalls. I mentioned earlier in the series that Jimmy was starting to get a little bit sort of, I don't know, exasperated or annoyed, frustrated at the amps he was playing. He was using these things right on the edge of what they were capable of. And I think that was difficult. And I actually, um, I had all day Friday, I, I think I spent 10 hours with this amp on the first day I had it. And I can see why the frustration. So when I take you through the controls in a minute, you'll see why. First of all, a few other details in this video. I'm using my Wilson um, strap, the one with the rosewood fretboard. And um, it has the Jimi Hendrix official 10 to 38 strings on, but this time the pure nickel ones, not the nickel plated. First, my first time playing pure nickel strings, they're quite expensive compared to like, the nickel plated ones in this series, I think were only six pounds for the set and this was 12, so like double the price. And honestly, within a few hours, you start to feel them like aging in your hand. It's like, it's quite sandpapery, but they sound great. We've got one more step with strings to go because this is still a hex core modern construction of a string. We've got another make of strings that does exactly the same Jimmy gauges and, and pure nickel, but with a round core, which is the actual what he was using. So that will be interesting later. The other thing you might, well, you must have spotted there was this Watkins copycat. Jim also had this and I've been wanting a proper analog tape delay machine for a long time. This is a 1963 model that runs on a proper valve preamp. So what you're hearing is your guitar is plugged in directly to the copycat. The copycat then plugs into the front of the amp and the copycat, I will do a whole video about this thing. It only has three settings of delay. It literally is the proper sort of tape machine that has the headers that record and repeat. So you've only got three specific settings, but it's got a preamp and you can actually use the preamp without the motor running the tape. So you can get that slightly saturated tape sound. Now I'll have that off for a bit in a minute when I show you how the amp works and you'll hear the difference. This really brings some life. And we know Jimmy was recording into some sort of tape machine and that's how we got delay on that. And there was a fixed delay of hundred milliseconds. I don't know the delay on a copycat on the three types of delay on there. If someone could tell me, that would be great. So look what I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna set up a camera showing you the Dual Showman and showing you why its controls are really quirky. Okay, this is as close as I've got. And it struck me over time that what I'm hearing in the record is a bit more scooped than what I think a tweed baseman would be. And at the same time, also just thicker and bigger. And so the idea of it being the 59 tweed baseman that we looked at, like, I've not seen Jimmy, I don't think, with a 59 tweed, but with a tweed basement cabinet, and would he have used that? If anything, I thought it was a basement head, a silver face or a black face one, which is still possible, but I think it was using two by 15s. Eddie Kramer famously said that he thought Jimmy was using eight by 10s that day, but that seems that, honestly, that could be a, just like a misremembering because Marshall made an eight by 10 and Fender made a two by 15, those cabinets would be about the same size as each other. So it's more of a chance he was playing into the 15, which we know he had. Right, let's have some fun hearing this at various settings um, and I'll tell you more about it. Okay, so these are the settings you heard at the beginning, but without the tape delay and a little bit of post-processing stuff that I'll tell you about in a minute. So as I said, no tape saturation, no tape delay, just the guitar set on about nine and the tone on the guitar sort of like three.
Okay, so on full, it's quite a beast without anything else in front of it, right? Without any saturation or t delay, because there's no reverb. And everything is on full, as you notice. And why is that? Well, it's because if I turn all of these to zero, we're not going to get anything. Okay, so it's got one of those EQs where the actual EQs do the volume as well in each frequency. So if we just allowed the treble, okay, that's on six. Now we add some middle. And now some bass. So if you hear that, without the treble being higher, the bass and then the treble, there's just not enough oomph in the treble part of the spectrum. But it's completely overshadowed. So I have to have the treble higher. Um, and then Let's say I put the treble and the bass on, is that trebles on 10 bass on like eight or nine? Okay, then you're missing the mids obviously, so. If I take those mids out, Okay, put them back in. So this means you're much more reliant on your guitar's tone and volume because basically to get the volumes he wanted and you know on all tens uh, I'm just going to back everything up I'll just tell you I've got a decibel meter that you can't see but everything on full yeah so that hit 111 but that's not crazy loud is it I've got lots of amps lots of smaller ones that go way above that now once you hit a fuzz or you put the tape saturation on yeah you're going to get more out of it um, but really this amp is limited I think partly because the, the 15 inch speakers, they need a lot of power to be moved. So in another video, we'll plug this into uh, an, a different cabinet. And we'll plug other amps into the two by 15 as well. But so I ended up with it all on full. And it's frustrating in a way, you can't really sculpt your tone that well using this. Let's say that I put the bass on about seven, right? Because I think that would seem more sensible. <laughs> So I mean, that's okay. There's just not a lot you can do. So basically I'm gonna have the middle and the trebles up as high as they go and the bass somewhere between seven and 10 and that's what I figured out. And then the volume is all the way up to 10. If I start turning that down. So really it needs to be there. Now I'm going to plug the tape machine in because he definitely was using tape. So it makes a lot more sense to do that. 
So you plug this into the front of the tape, turn the tape machine on and the motor. And then I just have to actually plug. This is from the tape machine. Okay. Now the tape machine has also got its own like gain controls. So I've got the gain on a little bit on there. But we want to see what the volume is like now. So it's about the same the way I've set it. If I put it too much higher, you're going to hear that tape machine in the background. I'm sorry. It is just literally where the two ends of tape meet and they go round, you hear that constantly. Not when you're playing, but otherwise. But this sounds so much better. on 10 again. That's with my guitar tone on just like two or something. Let me put that on about six, five. This is using the King Tone treble bleed switch on position five. Maybe there's not quite as much bass as 10. Let's put it on eight. So look, as we know, we're never going to 100% know what was recorded in that room. But so far, this is the closest I've got. Um, I thought, you know, the JTM 45 in the first episode, it sounded good. You know, I really enjoyed that. But was it exactly what I heard on the record? Not quite. There is a difference between a Marshall JTM and a Fender Bassman. Uh, not much of a difference, but there is one. And, and the Bassman, I thought, sounded a bit closer in the second episode. In the third episode, we had a bit of fun with the two rock, which I thought sounded 
amazing and definitely something Jimmy might have used. This amp, in a way, is the worst of the lot, right? It's the hardest to use, it's the least flexible to set up, it's absolutely massive, carrying it around would be a nightmare. Um, a blown 15 inch speaker is expensive to replace and probably not easy these days. Um, but to me, there's something in some of the tones I've got out of it that sounds so distinctively like the record. I just need to work on, obviously, getting the playing and the exact setup of it. Obviously, he didn't use a Watkins copycat tape machine. He would have used something else. So I never get, can't quite get that. This has its own sound as well. I might go back to using the Analog Man in the next video just to see what the difference is. And ultimately, it's tantalizingly close, but still, I was talking about this to someone else who does, you know, he's interested in sort of achieving a similar sort of sound. It's the closer you get, the further away you get. It's like a rolling road. It just, it's tantalizingly close. I hear snippets of it and I go, oh, that's it, that's the one. But there's so much going on in that record, played by, you know, to me, the best guitar player of all time, but let's say arguably one of the best guitar players of all time, one of the most inventive, experimental, and just sort of spine-chillingly brilliant to me, to me. Recorded in a professional studio with a great, you know, studio engineer and lots of great musicians around. It's gonna sound, it's not gonna be a sound I can 100% get to, but I'm so close. It gives me like real hope to just keep going. Um, so in the next one, we haven't talked much about the fuzz yet. Fuzz is obviously such an important part with Jimmy. We're gonna play around with a few different fuzz pedals, see where he used it in the track. I actually just assumed it was on for the whole track, but it turns out it's not, going by the official tab that I've got. So that'll be interesting to, um, to see what parts he used it for and how loud it will make this amp. So that's gonna be the next video. But I do think he was using a black or silver face Fender. And I think that's something that probably haven't heard much of in a Jimmy context overall because he's not famous for using that at all. But in this particular year, he was using them. So, as we go further along, you'll hear more and more of this amp. I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, please subscribe to the channel, give this video a thumbs up, and I'll see you pretty soon.